Um, thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. I thought about uh, starting my paper the way that I normally would, um, with a clever anecdote from a news article or a historical event, since that's what my advisor told me to do in graduate school, to hook an audience. This would lead to a statement about the broader implications and questions that said hook raises, um, and I would maybe then crack a joke that I'm sure not be nearly as funny or charming as I had imagined it when I first practiced. Perhaps the audience would know the only reason I was cracking jokes was because of my nervousness, and to get that nagging thought out of my head, I would move towards discussing the grandiose contributions my research would have on the field, hoping that the audience had lost enough interest and was tired enough of hearing other speakers that we could no they were no longer paying attention, and this whole anxiety-driven endeavor could just painlessly end. <laughs> Um, if you've been in academia for a while, uh, the experiences I'm describing are probably ones that you are familiar with. Uh, Emma Bell and Daniel King liken presenting at a conference to an endurance test, where conference goers battle headaches, lack of sleep, and dehydration to finally add that coveted next line to their CV. Tenure, or more commonly, continued contract renewal, here we come. Yet, despite their ubiquity, conferences are far from value-free phenomenon. Instead, they are bound within structures of power and privilege that pervade wider society. They represent an arena uh, they represent an arena where not only intellectual ability, but also social and financial capital play a major role. According to Emily Henderson, conferences are paradoxically both understudied and overstudied. On one hand, there is little empirical research on conferences as critical sites for knowledge production, and at the same time, almost all academics are intimately aware of conferences and their affective and embodied strains. Uh, concerns about conference travel and inclusion are particularly important for the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations and the conferences that it endorses both formally and informally, such as this one. Uh, despite attempts to expa expand inclusivity, quantitative analysis of conference paper submissions and special conference issues have shown that ADO conferences lack regional, linguistic, and gender diversity. Scholars of the Global South and Asia have also asserted uh, or that um, even, when the digital, even when digital humanities organizations attempt to uh, expand inclusivity, uh, they perpetuate a neo-colonial outlook where high-income countries are linguistically positioned as bringing enlightenment, funding, and knowledge to the quote-unquote uncivilized. Uh, notably, in a recent article in Digital Humanities Quarterly, organizers of the annual Digital Humanities Conference have outlined the many failures of diversity and inclusion that surround the event, despite numerous initiatives over the years. About two years ago, I began a project that delves deeper into the systemic issues surrounding inclusivity in the digital humanities by expanding on the work of the Index of Digital Humanities Conference, which was referenced a little while ago with the, the list of constructive um, constructive paradigms. Um, a database that covers approximately 60 years of DH conferences. There's about 7,300 presentations and um, there's around 8,700 authors, I believe. Um, the, the, the main insight of the project was to use university affiliation of each presenter as a proxy for, lo uh, as a proxy for where they were located and to chart their travel. Um, universities are major cultural inst and political institutions. Importantly, while many academics may see them as banal, uh, banal uh, they also frequent, uh, there are also frequent sites for travel, so you can think of campus tours and stuff like that. Um, consequently, GIS systems almost always map their location. I found I could reverse geocode the affiliation of the authors and get the latitude and lang longitude of each participant. Um, when the university affiliation was missing, I uh, used city or country if nothing else was available. Uh, of course, this is not perfect. Some individuals might submit papers from non-university affiliations, change affiliations between submissions, uh, or not live near their affiliation at all. Uh, however, for the majority of instances, this provided a useful and workable method to chart travel patterns. Uh, with this uh, data, I was able to build a complex and layered GIS map uh, to map the mobility of conferences. So I'm just going to pull up this map and let it play while I go through it. So th uh, what you're going to see is that uh, the white spots are where people land, like where the conference is, and the kind of darker colors are where they're coming from. 
Um, uh, this highlighted substantial discrepancies in travel and access patterns that reflected broader global issues of mobility and inequality. As Mimi Scheller and John Ari note, uh, although mobility has been framed as something neutral, travel is bound by race, gender, class, and ability. For instance, while many in the global north see movement as something done voluntarily for uh, pleasure, um, those in the global south are often forced to move due to political situations. Uh, as we can see from the visualization, scholars in the global south are notably underrepresented, and few conferences have been held in these regions. Uh, in contrast, conferences in North America and Western Europe tend to have a higher concentration of in uh, attendees, um, indicative of their relative accessibility uh, and uh, prestige within the field. Um, yet location is not the only factor affecting participation. Similar to the rest of society, there are barriers of gender and uh, race or ethnicity as well. Ethnicity and gender in many cases reflect state power manifesting in government databases like census and voter registration data. This state power serves as a source of violence for queer individuals um, and other marginalized communities who are often uh, left out, misrepresented, or wrongly categorized within such structures. Yet these databases are sometimes the only method we have to actually study patterns and trends of discrimination and bias and unmask systems of discrimination in academic practices. Uh, consequently, I inferred, uh, I used um, Lincoln Muller's gender package and uh, re-ethnicity package to infer gender and ethnicity based on name. And I want to make sure that um, in order to minimize the harm and violence that may come from misinterpreted data, um, these packages have very strict boundaries of how they can be used. Uh, specifically, they state that the data should only be used as a means of shedding light on discriminatory practices and that inferred data should only be used in the aggregate. Um, in addition, I want to make it clear that these are not how identities, um, uh, these are not categories of how these individuals see themselves as identity, uh, uh, um, how these individuals identify themselves, uh, but should be understood how these identities are understood through computational algorithms. Um, to maintain uh, further boundaries, I've chosen not to put counts of different groups and identities or map them in any way. Instead, I decided to run a generalized linear model. So this is basically a, a regression model with a uh, negative, bino uh, negative binomial generalized linear model for those of you that are interested in statistics. Um, in this, distance traveled served as the response variable and ethnicity, uh, gender, previous presentation. So if an author had presented at other, uh, how many uh, previous presentations that person had done, work type and authorship order and country were used as predictors. Um, and standardized parameters and confidence intervals were also calculated. Uh, the model's explanatory power was moderate, it explained about 20% of variance, and so not that, not everything, but uh, a good amount. Um, the results showed that an inference of male gender was statistically significant and showed a willingness and ability uh, to uh, travel more along with previous presentations and low authorship order. So if you were like the first author in a, in a paper. In contrast, uh, uh, when the inference was female, gender resulted in less likelihood to travel. Uh, and while the majority of participants were, uh, had inferred white ethnicities, their willingness or ability to travel was not significantly different from others. Over 80 countries were examined as predictors with most showing statistically significant and negative uh, uh, willingness or, or negative distance traveled, suggesting an unwilling, unwillingness for most presenters to travel huge distances. Overall, these results provide through, oh, and I have a, a graph here. Um, overall, uh, these results provide three key lessons into how the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations can improve equality within its conference attendance. One, most conference goers are actually unwilling to travel long distances. So the most common distance is actually very small. And the location of where the co annual conference is held is the most significant factor in including adding inclusivity. Holding conferences in the global south, uh, based on my research, is likely the single most important choice that ADDO can make to increase inclusivity. Two, research has shown that in contrast to male academics, female academics are much more likely to face top travel constraints due to caretaker responsibilities, which also need to be recognized and addressed. Therefore, ADDO may need to invest extra resources to facilitate the mobility of female scholars or female identifying scholars. Um, steps such as providing travel grants or childcare solutions could potentially reduce these barriers. And finally, the data indicates that more experienced authors, so those with uh, more previous presentations and with lowership author order, um, so that means they were first author in the paper, 
suggests that the appeal of uh, conference travel increases with a scholar's reputation and involvement. Therefore, the organization uh, wants to try to incentivize, or should try to incentivize newer authors. Ultimately, the bigger task lies in transforming the academic travel culture and creating an atmosphere of inclusiveness and equal opportunities for all. This does not only rest to the shoulders of conference organizers, but the academic community as a whole. It is important to understand that the countless individual decisions, preferences, and biases of researchers across the globe uh, create the larger patterns that we see. It's not a simply enough to reveal these patterns, but we must also take action to confront and change them. While state and institutional policies do play a significant role, uh, the responsibilities on uh, us as scholars is also significant. It's through conscious and ethical actions that we can envision a more inclusive academic community. Thank you. Okay.